Okay, we have a very special guest speaker tonight, Dr. John Eastman. He's the Henry Salvatore Professor of Law and Community Service at Chapman University School of Law and also served as school dean from June 2007 to June, January 2010 when he stepped down to pursue a bid for the California Attorney General's office. And uh, some of us are members of the uh, CCRs and familiar with that as a statewide organization. Uh, it was the, he was the only contested uh, Republican who won uh, not the uh, approval of the CCR group who got a, their endorsement. He's the founding director of the Center for the Constitutional Jurisprudence of Public Interest Law firm affiliated with the Claremont Institute. Previously, Dr. Eastman was the Henry Salvatore Professor of Law and Community Service. Prior to joining Chapman Law Faculty in August of 1999, he served as a law clerk with Justice Thomas, Clarence Thomas, at the Supreme Court of the United States and with Judge Michael Ludig at the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth District. After the clerkships, Dr. Eastman practiced with the national law firm of Kirkland and Ellis, specialized in major civil and constitutional litigation at both the trial and appellate levels. Matter of fact, he was in court, I believe, today on Proposition 8, and uh, there may be a few questions on that. He earned his JD from the University of Chicago Law School, where he graduated with high honors in 1995. His topic is re retroactive pensions, illegal immigration, Obamacare, and Libya. Do the constitutions matter anymore? Let's give John a big welcome. <laughs> Lincoln 
was one of the strongest advocates of eliminating slavery in this country. But he said, we cannot do it by ignoring the law. Because what we will lose is the ability to have a cohesive society that makes pos possible the prospect of freedom for all of us if we lose the notion of the rule of law. That's what's going on with the illegal immigration. It's got, it's got less to do anymore than who's coming here and when and in what numbers and what they're costing us. The notion that we can just thumb our nose at the law and expect that we're not going to rip apart as a society is the much greater consequence for the failures here. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so, so, so my constitutional litigation center is involved in the SB 1070 litigation at, at the Supreme Court of the United States right now. Obamacare, the same thing. The Constitution gives the Congress the power to regulate commerce among the states. I always thought from my English teachers that words have meaning. That means it's got to be commerce. And when I take your blood pressure, that's not commerce, right? And it's not anything that's got to do with among the states. I always thought it had to be both commerce and interstate in order to, for it to fall under Congress's authority. Uh, Obamacare does neither. The regulation of the Arroyo Toad or the Delta Smelt are neither commerce nor interstate, right? These things, uh, they've gotten the view that they can do whatever they want. You remember, she's from up here, right, Nancy Pelosi? <laughs> Well, you've got to, we've got to wait till we pass it, till we see what's in it. And, and somebody said, where's your authority? And she said, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? We can do whatever we want. Well, well, we adopted a system that rejected the notion that Parliament and the King could do whatever they want. And, and just to make clear that we did that, we put it down in writing so that they would know what their authority is. Now, now, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton were concerned when some of the states who weren't going to ratify until we got a Bill of Rights said, we have a concern about having a Bill of Rights. You need a Bill of Rights when you have an all-powerful king to tell him what he can do. But when you have a Congress that can only do what you've authorized it to do, we fear that by listing a Bill of Rights and saying, you know, you, you, you can regulate commerce, and then if you say, and you can't infringe on the free exercise of religion, that they would have assumed that they had the authority under that commerce power to infringe on your free exercise of religion, but for the Bill of Rights. And they were afraid of offering the Bill of Rights because then it would imply that the government was otherwise unlimited, except for those few little carve-outs. Now, James Madison tried to solve that problem. He promised, okay, we'll do a Bill of Rights. New York and a few other states insisted on it. But he passed the Ninth Amendment. It says the powers, the, the, the rights enumerated here are not the full scope of it. To try and say that we still have a doctrine of enumerated powers that limits the powers that the federal government can do. And if you can't find it in that list of powers in Article 1, Section 8, they don't get to do it. And nowhere in there is to tell me that I've got to buy health insurance to go to my local doctor when it's not commerce and it's not interstate.
uh, giveaway books. I'm going to give away books at the end for anybody that makes a donation to our litigation center. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, that has, uh, it's, it's uh, the editor, the, uh, the chief editor is Ed Meese, who writes the preface. I have a chapter in the book. It's the history of the conservative, freedom based public interest law movement in this country that began with Governor Ronald Reagan in California as he tried to do welfare reform here in California. And every leftist public interest law firm tried to stop him at every step of the way. And he told Ed Meese, we got we to gotta set up a conservative version of these public interest law firms to, to weigh in on the other side, to defend people, to defend taxpayers, to defend citizens against government when government is getting in the way of their liberty. And the public interest law movement that was founded with the Pacific Legal Foundation in 1973, you've got the National Right to Work group in, in Washington, D.C., you've got the Center for uh, Inst Individual Rights, you've got the Institute for Justice, you've got the Mountain States Legal Foundation, you've got my own Claremont Institute Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence. This is the vast right-wing conspiracy that Hillary talked about. We all get together twice a year, by the way. We, we do it at a different hotel every time, in case they figure out where we are. <laughs> but, but you want to look at that group, and we strategize, and we think long term. And so back in 1973, they put in place a series of legal challenges to the expansive scope of the commerce power that was Wickard versus Filburn. And in 1995, they had a huge success when the Supreme Court of the United States, under Chief Justice Rehnquist, struck down a provision of the Gun-Free Schools Act, Zones Act that said it's a matter of federal law that you can't possess a gun in a school. Now, I'm not in favor of kids possessing guns in school. Well, maybe. Sometimes that would be good. Right? But that's a matter of state law. We don't need a federal law on that. It doesn't have anything to do with interstate commerce. Right? And the court said that that was invalid because there was nothing to do with interstate commerce. Right? Uh, that conservative movement uh, produced that. We lost a little ground on the marijuana case here in California, and I'm not a fan of the medical marijuana, but I do. I am a fan of California making that decision itself. Whether stupid or, or wise, it was California's decision to make, not the national government. Obamacare, if their principles um, take root in that case, there is nothing that the federal government will not be able to do. We bail out General Motors, and now we've got to pay it back. Well, not enough of you are buying General Motors cars. And so I'm going to mandate is a condition that's necessary and proper to help General Motors get the money they need to pay back the taxpayers from the loan we gave them on the bailout to make you all buy General Motors cars. Why not? It's the same principle at issue in Obamacare. We're now going to be providing everybody medical care. And we know for a fact, if you eat healthier rather than not, that you'll have less need of those health care services. And so I'm going to compel you to eat broccoli instead of pizza, instead of Italian, instead of whatever. All right? Think about I mean, it because it's, it, it's, it's not too far a step from the claims they're making in Obamacare. In fact, in this 10-minute video that Reason TV did, we eat in Obamacare. They've got me, and they've got Erwin Chemerinsky. How many, of, how many of you listen to the Hugh Hewitt show and hear me and Erwin all the time? I have to apologize for every time we do that show, you have to listen to Erwin as well. It's just part of the deal. right? But they have Erwin on here, and he says there is nothing that Congress cannot do. And the judge in Florida cited Erwin for that proposition um, in ruling that this is what's wrong with the law. right? So, so in the immigration stuff, they're ignoring the statutes. But the Obamacare, they're ignoring the limits on their own power, that is the Constitution, uh, in Libya. So that's domestic. 